Hi, you're tuning in to another Asia Gaming Briefs face-to-face -face interviews. I'm joined today by entrepreneur and futurist Earl Hall, CEO of Axis. Uh, last April, um, just towards the peak of the pandemic, we talked to Earl about some of the um, about what the future holds post-pandemic in a webinar called Life After COVID. Uh, so one year later, we sit down with Earl again to reflect on some of the predictions made, uh, what was expected, maybe some things that were unexpected, and you know, give a little bit of, of an update on what we see coming. Um, so Earl, welcome and thanks for joining us again. Thanks very much. It's uh, great to be here. So last year during our webinar, uh, you, you made 16 predictions about how life was going to change as a result of the pandemic. Um, maybe we just start off with um, what do you see ringing the most true out of those 16 predictions? Well, I don't know. I'm smiling because I'm thinking probably the one I'd love to say first is the one I did not foresee, which is I did not predict everybody gaining 15 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> Sorry, but I had to say that one because it's like a general conversation everywhere that you're allowed to have extra weight now because of COVID. Yeah. Can I also mention that um, I, I didn't expect um, some people to completely shave their heads and some people to grow their hair, their hair out like rock stars, you know, in the pandemic. I think everyone was trying to experiment with new looks, you know, since they didn't have to really do as many meetings and, and face to face as they did before. Well, I think you have to remember everybody that's been growing beard and long hair, like even on my team, it started off with because there was no hairdressers, there was no nothing. And then it just turned into one of these unexpected fads. My theory on those people who uh, shaved their heads, it's because their self cuts at home didn't go that well. <laughs> <laughs> But when we got, when we look at all of those things, and remember, I did this for fun because I love patterns. I love anything that you can put into an algorithm. When I was looking at this on the outset, the one that stood out the most above everything, of which one piece of this I did not predict, although I was praying for it, was cashless would become king. The slogan, uh, COVID carries cash became something that I was saying almost on a daily basis. But, and we knew that digitalization would pick up and COVID became the catalyst. But the outstanding, amazing thing that happened during COVID was that PayPal migrated its platform towards the ability to buy digital currency, which automatically moved the KYC problems out of the way. And now we're into a speed of digitalization that I don't think anybody could have ever predicted because even though it was going fast, we knew we had to go to cashless, smart card cashless, contactless apps. I don't think anybody could have seen the speed of adoption that PayPal has created with digital currency. Yeah, and, and what you're saying about digitalization and not just in cash, but just uh, um, like there was a time where we couldn't leave the house. Everything that you wanted to consume, um, except for food, basically, had to come digitally. Entertainment had to come digitally, right? Um, live dealer, I'm just, just bringing this back to gambling, but live dealer um, just soared in popularity because there, there wasn't any physical casinos to go to. There was a time where there was no sports to bet on. So yeah, live dealer, human interaction uh, over the internet, that was the closest thing that we could get to, to having a, a social gambling experience. Um, and, and I've seen, you know, just since November, I think they started to release these new live dealer games, which are kind of like your game show type. So deal or no deal, um, Monopoly lie, Wheel of Fortune. But, you know, they, they created this kind of new live dealer game, um, which you know, like, and, and sorry, and I'm kind of jumping ahead to one of the other predictions that you said, which was around how, um, uh, you know, innovation is born during contraction. Uh, oh, and, and I've seen so much of it in the last year. Um, when it comes to innovation, there's, I think, from what I'm seeing, there's been more happen in 12 months than the four years prior is about the numbers that we're looking at right now. 
artificial intelligence has jumped, digitalization has jumped. Uh, I was saying back then that robots don't get sick. Mm. McDonald's has already announced and is in trial in several locations with robot drive throughs if you can believe it. So there's so many things that have happened. Uh, when I spoke about Maslow is back, the pyramid of Maslow. Well, who would have put money on the fact that housing prices would dramatically increase? Here in Las Vegas, instead of the housing market taking a hit during the contraction, the amount of people that have been upselling their houses because expendable income was not going to entertainment, uh, cars, the increase in the purchase of new cars, so many things happen because of isolation that I'm kind of sad I didn't predict all of them, but some of them were kind of like no brainers. Yeah, I'm, I'm interesting that you talk about housing prices and car prices going up because the same things happened in Australia. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a more interesting um, uh, additional thing on top of that was car prices for classic, prestige and, and collectible cars went up even more than regular used cars. So used cars went up about 30%. And that was a, a study made in December last year in mm -hmm. Australia. But uh, collectible cars probably went up double, like 100% prices. Off-road vehicles went about up about 70% because we were in summer um, and around you know December time last year. So everyone was kind of going into Christmas holidays. They wanted to travel, but they couldn't, right? So the best thing that they could do is buy an off-road capable vehicle and go out to the middle of nowhere in Australia in the bushland and, and camp camp over Christmas. And like, and, and it, it's like, like you say, isolation just created this kind of weird bubble where everyone just, you couldn't do the things you normally do. So you just go and expand in the way that you can. Right. And now the question is, is well, will it last? If you remember uh, the, the introduction of my presentation last year talked about some premises that are age old human behavior uh, ways that humans cannot get around. In other words, the Spanish flu did its thing, but as soon as the Spanish flu ended, the roaring 20s really erased all of the isolation and everything else. So during this pandemic, we've seen people buying uh, campers, we've seen them buying houses, we've seen them buying old cars to fix up, model planes on the internet, a whole bunch of crazy stuff. But the thing we're seeing the most is that humans still need to be around human beings. And the thing, when I was talking about cultural intelligence in corporations, the thing that we have seen the most is isolation distress. If I was to talk about probably one of the saddest predictions that I made all last year is that the level of distress from physical isolation would be exponential. And unfortunately it has been because I spend literally five to seven hours every single day on Zoom, sent cameras to my team. I oblige everybody to be on camera all the time so we can laugh, joke around and do everything else. But even the tools that have emerged cannot bridge the isolation because like I said, extroverted people need to hug. They're suffering the most, but the introverts, the guys like me, we need to be in a public place, not talking to anybody, but we need to be around people. And one of the short-term patches that I found for the introverts like me on the team is in their houses and in their offices, we stick uh, large television screens in front of them and like I run a virtual coffee shop on my screen all day. It's a, it's a place on YouTube where you can go and people are chatting live. And there's about six or 7,000 people in this virtual coffee shop. And I'm alone, but at least I see movement in this virtual coffee shop. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I remember at the start of the pandemic when everyone was required to work from home, um, there was that kind of initial feeling of people thinking, well, we could maybe do this forever um you know like yeah, it, it was convenient not to be able to travel to work but one year on later and i've noticed that everyone's kind of itching to get back into the office even if it's just one day a week or two days a week that there's, there's that yeah 
So there, the things that I've been doing with my own team and with the people that I'm exposed to in the industry that I talk to in other companies is, as I said last March, was, and this was something that I was actually researching or last April was researching before that, it's the principle that's emerging of cultural intelligence. In other words, a company culture is now a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Every single human being has to design their relationship with the organization. Some people need to be in the office five days a week. I have somebody on my team that suffered dramatically to not be in the office every day. He's an extrovert, likes to be around people, likes to talk to people, likes to take care of people. That guy suffered like I've never seen. But even the introverts need to get out of the house. It's great to be in the house, but I'm developing a new theory that I'd like to call caged line theory, which means even when you're, even if you're an introvert, but you've been in the same environment, the same house for too long, the same desk for too long, you start to get inside of your mentality that you can't even go out anymore. So the thing that I've been researching on this, that we saw the signs before COVID, but what we're seeing now is that Every individual needs an individual contract with their organization on their work ethic, when they work, how they work, where they work. But the general consensus is, is there has to be some touch point for everybody to meet. Is it for them to work around a table? Most probably not. But is it for them to sit around a table and maybe share a meal, share an activity, share a laugh? the human contact, whether you're an extrovert or an ex introvert, they need to find that hub together. And I think that's something that's going to take a year or two for organizations to figure out, but it's very clear that that trend is long-term, that we're going into a flexible environment, but there's going to be no such thing as 100% virtual. And, and, and that's that's a very interesting point. And, and I'd like to bring it back to the casino and gambling space a little bit, if we may, um, because obviously all of these kind of social distancing restrictions that are still around in, in some countries, uh, and there's also the threat of the pandemic kind of resurfacing year after year. I'm not a medical expert, so I can only really see what I've um, say what I've read, but um, is there going to be a change to how uh, employees work in casinos and is there going to be a change how customers are entering casinos and, and all these kind of social distancing restrictions will they continue past the pandemic well first of all there's the law and there's the reality and uh freshly coming out of the las vegas strip on saturday night I had to go there for a dinner, which is not summer where I really go down that often because I, I live out farther in town. But first of all, the word social distancing on Saturday night in Las Vegas was less than two inches, if you can believe it. So that six foot or that couple of meter rule did not exist anywhere. And being like an introvert who likes my space, I was absolutely freaked out because now after being in COVID for so long, I have this large space that I love that I didn't have Saturday night. So will social distancing keep up for customers? I don't think so. Will they come back to the casinos? Most definitely the casinos that I, were in, that I was in Saturday night were booming like during a trade show. It was absolutely nuts. Now, when it comes to employees, um, I'm not hearing that much in North America of um, changing in shifts, changing in a whole bunch of things. Because when you're in a B2C industry, it's all pretty much built on a boilerplate way of doing work. So will the customers come back? Will the customers go back to the old ways? You should have seen them banging on uh, craps and roulette uh, with no social distancing on Saturday night. Uh, for the employees, uh, I think the employees will be wearing masks for a very long time because as you mentioned, we're going to hit five to seven waves of COVID in the different jurisdictions 
before herd immunity, which is number of people that have had COVID, meets number of vaccines, which means the virus cannot jump to immune people to make it to the person that can catch it on the other side. I still think we have an uphill battle there, but will it change the way we deploy product and the way customers receive product? I haven't seen any indication and, and, and I've only been in about four countries during COVID. So, but in those countries, I haven't seen any indications that post pandemic, we're going to see anything close to just going right back to who we were before because um, the casino industry has been around for so long, the way to play, the way to act. There's all these little plastic things hanging around now. But uh, the plastic thing is between two people. But I've seen three, four, five people with their arms on each other's shoulders over that one player position. And as you know, the casino industry very well, as much as I do, on a Saturday night when everybody's all liquored up, it's not time to start pushing them back and making sure that there's six feet between them. So there's balance that has to come. But the, our saving grace is herd immunity versus um, the vaccines. When do you expect um, somewhat of a normality to return to, to these uh, uh, gaming jurisdictions? Once again, it's, it all depends on the number of people that have been infected and that survived and the number of vaccines. So I'm in a country right now where uh, the aggressivity of the rollout of the vaccines is quite high. It's like when you go to Dubai or you go to the United Emirates, the uh, amount of vaccines being deployed there is absolutely tremendous. But once again, if I was going to parcel this down country by country right now, it would be all about herd immunity, number of survived people with the number of vaccines will be the prediction on when things will find some sense of normality. Uh, I think the United States is going to be very ahead of the curve just for the simple, the simple reason is that the, the rights in this country, the way people act, are pushing the barriers a little bit and uh, it's a little bit different than a country that's following the rules very strictly. Uh, is that good news for Las Vegas? Oh yeah, if I, if what I saw Saturday night, which was the intersection between spring break and March madness is of any indication, I think Las Vegas will be healthier sooner rather than later. Well, that's really, really good news. And I think you're right. People, people want to return to what they know and, and what makes them happy. Um, I think the, the post-COVID uh, future, we're going to see people returning back to this normality, um, but we're going to be powered by better technology and, and better innovation as a result of the pandemic, you know, pushing, accelerating um, technology forward, right? A hundred percent. Will people, people bet online? Will people play poker online? I think anything that's digital is going to increase exponentially over the next three years. But will that deter them away from a social activity with their friends in a casino at Crown or in Macau or in Las Vegas? There is no chance. Right now, everybody I talk to is just itching at the bit to get back to a conference, to hug their friends and have a brew with their friends. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted just to finish off this interview right around here as, as we left it at a great note, but um, there is one, one more little trend that I've noticed um, just in the last few weeks. And uh, since I have you here, I'd love for you to, to comment about it. And that's NFTs, uh, which have made a lot of headlines. <laughs> I was going to say it earlier <laughs> yeah. and I decided to bite my tongue. And now that you've opened up the door, I'll have at it. I've opened up Pandora, Pandora's box. So not, yeah, not <laughs> really, not really because hmm. see what most people what generally is not understood about the digitalization of our planet is that it includes everything. So whereas we were hiding baseball cards under mattresses 30 years ago, whereas people had rolled up canvases of great paintings hundreds of years ago, in today's digital world, a digital asset because an NFT is nothing more than an asset that has value that is not in physical form. 
So if we took the word NFT away for a second and we started listing all of the highly valuable items we have in our iPhones or our Androids that are not in physical form, can you imagine the list we could draw up? That's all NFTs is. And that's the excitement of finally getting to NFTs where digital assets now have value. Mm, mm. Yeah, there, there does seem to be a lot of hype about it. But in the end, um, and if you can just explain really quickly, you know, it, it's, it's um, in, in your own words, NFT is, uh, is just like a digital certificate. It, it's an ownership of an asset, right? Which is something yes. you can trade and, and sell uh, to, to another owner. Is that right? Yeah, so in, in the IT world, if we go all the way back to the word, where the word certificate comes from, certificate for a secure website, certificate for a secure transaction. When, when we started off this internet world, it was all about handing out a digital token, we called them back then, of which now they're a digital asset. And all it's, it says is, can you imagine if I scanned a baseball card that was worth a million dollars and I scanned it in very high resolution and I gave it a digital certificate so that it's true and authentic. How much is that digital baseball card worth? Well, the old guys would say, oh, it's worth nothing because I don't have the piece of paper. But in 20 years from now, when paper is going to be something way in the past, all of those physical assets that really, why, why were they physical? They were physical because they got washed. <laughs> they were left out in the rain. Um, mom threw them away. Something happened to them. The ink faded out on them because they weren't in the proper plastic. We're going finally into the exciting age of blockchain because a digital asset has to be contained within a secure environment. So all a, an NFT is, is anything you can think of in the physical world that can be replicated into the virtual world. Well, that's what an NFT is. And I think uh, you're going to see a lot of digital paintings. I think in the sports world, we're going to see the biggest boom once all of the soccer, football, baseball, hockey, and all those people start creating blockchains to trade and hold their digital cards. I hear that noise right now, which means we may see that as early as next year. But NFT is here to stay. It is as core to the digital world as cryptocurrency is. Thank you very much, Earl, for the time today. Um, it's, been, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, I'd love to hear more of your predictions in the future um, and hope we catch up again soon. Great. Thank you very much.